We're on, guys. <clears throat> awesome. So what are we doing today, guys? Well, ironically, you already... It's like a rhetorical question. You already know what we're doing, right? Well, so, right, but you gotta you got to play host, right? you got to do the... Sure, you sure. got to fall into all the trappings of hosting the show, right? <laughs> and, and leading the conversation. I'm, I'm today's guinea pig. Um, so Scott and... Uh, uh, Cam had said, let's do a learn module. Let's like walk through a learn module. And I was like, this is a great idea. And they're like, but you're going to do it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I have to walk through a learn module. Uh, so we have this ACA link here. So aka.ms forward slash learn hyphen identity. And if you follow that, it takes you to a learn module that was beautifully crafted by my two peers here, Scott and Cam. So should we take a step back before we dive into that and explain what Microsoft Learn is? Yeah. What is Learn? What is this? So Learn... Uh, time <laughs> out. We've, we've got a, a video download cancellation error in Twitch. Do what? A who, where, what? Are you seeing that? I'm not seeing it. Okay. If it's if you're not seeing it, then it's just me. Should I go there and check it out? Well, I'm Let's do go that live. What? It's going to be like an infinite screen of craziness. Okay, it's back now. I refreshed. Disregard. No, that's that's us. That's us from like five seconds ago. <laughs> we're good. Uh, we're good. <laughs> Luis says you can see the screen. Okay, awesome. great. <clears throat> I love Luis. He's great. He's uh, always he, he So he was just in... Fritz's stream a minute ago, so he he ditched Fritz's stream for us. Oh wow, awesome! That's dedication. That's great. So, um, so yeah, we were going to talk about what is Microsoft Learn. Yeah, what is it? You guys tell me. I, I've never done anything with it before. Yeah, so, so I'll give you a high level overview of what Learn is. So Microsoft Learn is is um, the .NET Docs teams attempt to uh, let customers really kick the tires uh, using .NET Core and Azure mm -hmm. uh, without spending any money. It's not going to cost them a thing. Uh, we provide an interactive environment in the Azure Cloud Shell. Uh, we provide an editor and uh, a command line where they can just, again, kick the tires, try out different services, and see how they integrate with uh, .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, EF Core. Um, that's what our team's using this for. But the scope goes well beyond the .NET Docs team. Uh, most of our products have uh, modules out here um, to help customers get up to speed on those products. What we wanted to talk about today is specifically ASP.NET Core identity. It turns out there's a module out here that we had just updated yesterday to uh, .NET Core 3.1, the latest LTS release. Um, identity is this framework you would use in ASP.NET Core for things like authentication and authorization. Um, that's what this module is um, going to walk through. Okay. And it, it turns out uh, this module consists of what we call units or steps. It consists of eight units. Okay. So it'll walk you through from beginning to end, providing that interactive experience. Awesome. So we have an introduction. It looks like we can set up our environment, various exercises for configuring identity support and customizing it, and multi-factor auth and claims, you know, policy-based. Oh, that's awesome. Knowledge check. This is great. So, this, so this is where we land. And, and and to level set a little bit, I, I'll say that the modules that Scott and I write, we, we take a little bit of a different philosophy than than um, what a lot of learn learn modules do. A lot of learn modules will give you a lot of conceptual information up front. Mm -hmm. um, we really wanted to take the take the angle of okay, we're developers. We want to get our hands on code fast, right? I mean, what what do we do when we go to uh, when we go to a document? We are we're, we're always looking for the samples first. <clears throat> sure. So cool. um, let's let's get the ball rolling. So this is this is the first page of the of the module, and this is the you know the summary. This is what you're what you're going to learn, the prerequisites, and all that. This is just a standard page. This is on all of the all the modules. Um, go ahead and click start there, Dave. And well, I just want to make sure. Oh, okay. Go yeah. ahead. sure. Experience Sorry. writing C sharp beginner level. 
Uh, I I think I'll be good with that. We'll hit we'll hit start. I'll Can I point out it. that you are wearing a C sharp superhero? <laughs> <shirt>? <laughs> Yes, that's a great observation. Thanks for that. Um, okay, introduction. Uh, dog toy retailer, Consanto. Ba, 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 ba. Yep. Learning objectives, Con- prerequisites Con- again. Cool. Contoso, Contoso Pets is the fictional company that Scott and I use uh, for all of the modules that we co-write. Um, we, we were trying to come up with, you know, a, a kind of a case study that we could revisit over and over again. And I, I'm a huge pet person i had my dog in the room at the time and i'm like i know oh, let's dog sell dog toys that's great no it's uh contoso isn't there like a uh con- another name for like common fabricam the, the the two that microsoft uses for everything are contoso and fabricam okay i thought there was a, a variation of this one actually consanto or something like that different maybe i just have been you might be thinking of um adventure works the database Okay. Um, okay, so now we click here, and we've got this little setup environment. So now we're into the module. We're in Unit 2. We've got past our prerequisites, the introduction, uh, and now we're going to set up the environment. So it looks like, okay, we're in the context of Azure Cloud Shell over here. So it looks like you have to activate the sandbox. So I'm going to click on that, and it's doing some stuff. Review so, permissions. Do I click on this? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and let, let's explain a little bit about what that is. So, the really neat thing that Microsoft Learn does is it provides this sandbox environment where you can go and you can try Azure resources uh, without any cost to you. It's all on, on Microsoft's account. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, so um, now, of course, it's a .NET module and not explicitly an Azure module, but mm-hmm. we take advantage of lots of, uh, of, of the sandbox environment to use <clears throat> lots of Azure services to kind of simulate like a real world application. Okay. <clears throat> so what it's doing right now is it's actually spinning up uh, a, an empty resource group and an empty, uh, uh, well not an empty, but a, a, an instance of the Azure Cloud Shell that you can use for um, use for this module. It only takes a couple of minutes here, and, and you'll sure. see, as soon as the countdown in, uh, finishes, you'll have a, a command prompt on the right there. One other thing you'll notice at the top there is a feature in Docs that we call Zone Pivots. Um, you're given the opportunity to select your underlying data store of choice. Do you want Postgres or do you want SQL Server? Uh, we were very intentional in this module with making Postgres the default. Uh, one of the common misconceptions out there is that things like ASP.NET Core Identity only work with uh, Microsoft data stores like SQL Server. Uh, we wanted to dispel that myth, uh, which is why that is an option here. Awesome. That's really cool. I like that. Um, are these the only two data stores that exist in terms of identity? No, it was just the the two that we chose. We well, the SQL Server was kind of like okay, we're we're gonna do SQL Server because that's the one that comes out of the box, and and then yeah. we were like okay, do we want to do Postgres? Do we want to do um, what were the other ones we looked at? We looked at SQLite. Um, Cosmos was another one. We did try Cosmos. We actually couldn't get Cosmos working with Identity. We could get it working with Entity Framework, but not with Identity which is built yeah. on, on Entity Framework. Now, I've noticed that your Cloud Shell's thrown, uh, thrown a little um, uh, issue there, uh, Dave, yeah. that, that you were logged in to the Cloud Shell with an account that's different than your Docs account. And it's because your, your Docs account is your Microsoft.com account. And I think when, you, when it prompted you to um, bless all of this with the sandbox and everything, I mm-hmm. think you might have logged in with your like your Outlook slash Hotmail, you know, what we used to call Windows Live accounts, what we oh, okay. what, what we call Microsoft accounts, which is confusing because we all have Microsoft.com domain accounts as well. So if I just hit sign out here, I can re-sign in, I'm assuming? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's hit sign out. And I want this one, right? Correct. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Well, that's the one that we're signing out of. Um, yeah, I don't know. Sign out of everything and just sign into everything again. <laughs> Let's just press buttons. Uh, close the browser. Let's close the okay. browser. Let's open this up. Press bu- press buttons, see what breaks. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. It's just... 
So most okay. users, by the way, are not going to not going to encounter that. Um, it's again, it's kind of that that funky situation that we have, where we have yes. you know employees, have <laughs> MSA accounts, and Microsoft.com accounts, and we have to juggle them sometimes. So at this point, you are logged into Docs as David Pine at Microsoft.com. Uh -huh. I th think, I don't know. Hit start and see what happens. <laughs> If we Let's have to, do it. if we have to try it a few times, we have to try it a few times. And again, this is all just, I think, beneficial for people to see. So I would click this one then, right? Uh, yes, the Microsoft that's, one. That's the same one. Okay. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, hopefully well, it works. I, I think so. I think part of the problem is I have all these different accounts. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. there we go. Hey. Ah. Okay. Much better. Awesome. All right, so let's go over here. Starting that, let's copy Listen, this. I'm well, assuming so. before you before you do that, I'm gonna recommend. Yeah. I'm actually gonna recommend that you do the SQL Server path. The uh, the Postgres path takes just a little bit longer up front to provision the Postgres server. The SQL okay. the SQL Server provisions much quicker, and okay. it's basically the same workflow going all the way through. Okay. Uh, copy button and use Shift Insert. Ta da! Enter. Let's run that. So what is this command doing? So this is the setup script for this module. So for all the modules that Scott and I have written, we have we have this infrastructure of of reusable scripts that we can configure um, mm -hmm. that go out and for, the first thing that does is it installs the, the version of the .NET Core SDK that's required for this module. In this case, it's the latest. It's 3.1.201, 201, 200. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's the the current the the, the current LTS one. Sure. Um, so we, you can see right now we're downloading that and installing it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's 201. Ooh, look at that. Yeah, then, cool. we, then we have .NET bot greet you. Now what <laughs> it's doing is it's downloading the code. Actually, it did download the code that you're going to use in this module. And now it's going through a series of uh, provisioning things in Azure that you're going to use. So that's pretty amazing. So that one little thing there, you know, basically starting this up, we get like this full, rich, immersed experience where we have everything. It's pulling the code. It's cloning things. It's got the repo. It's got the latest bits. It's installing the runtime. It's spinning up what appears to be like a virtual environment that I can interact with in this cloud shell. And it has all the various resources. I mean, manually doing that by yourself would take a lot of time and experience and expertise. And you kind of alleviated all of that, right? I yeah, and you raise a good point there. So one of the reasons why we have you uh, as the student run this script is the focus here is on teaching you ASP.NET Core identity. The focus is not on how do you provision all of these uh, Azure resources. Uh, for the curious, though, we do provide the commands in that bluish colored font over in Azure Cloud Shell. If you're curious which Azure CLI commands are being executed to provision oh, the resources, yeah, they're yeah. actually all listed there. That's awesome. I love that. You can actually thank Scott Hanselman for that. Um, when we were doing our um, Entity Framework module is where we, mm -hmm. we came up with this this whole infra the script infrastructure that we have. And we had shown him this uh, the script for the Entity Framework module that at the time basically did basically showed the .NET bot and said, okay, I'm going to do some stuff and I'll tell you when I'm done. Mm -hmm. And he said, but, 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 but what are you doing? Show me what you're doing. I want to yeah. know. So... Yeah. That's that's that makes why a lot we of did sense. that, and that's a lot of commands. Like the the Azure CLI, I've used it before, and um, there's a lot of stuff that just happened there. And I remember at times, you know, having to uh, look through the docs and read the reference stuff and try to understand the parameters and am I doing this right and is this the right time to do that or interact with this resource you create and that's awesome. So that's very helpful. Well, and I'm I'm pretty proud of the scripts we've written there too um, that that run all that because it's actually running. Everything that can run asynchronously, it's running asynchronously. So it's it's taking as little time as possible. That's awesome. So here's another quick observation. I didn't realize that the cloud shell could actually pull up like source code and highlight it. And this is quickly becoming very sexy. Yeah, what you're looking at here is what's referred to as the Azure Cloud Shell Editor. Um, at first glance, you would swear that you're looking at VS Code in the browser. Yeah. Uh, think of it as a stripped down version of that. This is so cool. Awesome. Okay. So now we've set up our development environment. 
uh, it shows, you know, kind of itemizes all the things that the script did. Uh, so let's look at the architecture. Um, so rather than me reading this aloud, uh, could I ask you two as the authors to kind of summarize the bits here? Sure, Scott, yeah, go ahead. Take a crack at that. So if you look at the Azure Cloud Shell editor over on the right side of uh, David's screen there, you're seeing just one project that makes up this starter solution that we have. And this is the UI project. Uh, it's based on ASP.NET Core Razor Pages. So then if you direct your attention to the left side of the screen where this diagram is, it's that purple box there in the diagram that represents what you're seeing in the Azure Cloud Shell editor on the other side of the, the screen. Ah, okay. uh, everything below that represents things within this Razor Pages project um, and actually the solution as a whole. Uh, things that are needed to make uh, ASP.NET Core identity work in this scenario. So you can see something called EF Core Identity Store, for example. We're using Entity Framework Core, in this case with the SQL Server provider, to connect to an Azure SQL database. And is it's it this, safe? Sorry, go ahead. Say, is it safe to assume that this imagery and like the architecture overview would be dynamic and changed uh, Postgres if that's what you would have selected? Yeah, you can you can actually scroll back. It's just a zone, what we call a zone pivot. So all it does is change the document. If you go back up and switch back over to Postgres, you can watch the document uh, flex. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. Perfect. Awesome. And so you notice there, you know, quick observation, when he toggled from SQL Server to Postgres, really the big change was the database provider that's being used with Entity Framework Core. Uh, we swapped SQL Script, Server yeah. out with Postgres. Yeah, let's see that again. So, like, if you watch down here, I'll highlight that and switch it. It goes to PG for Postgres. So it actually changes the script as well. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah, so that's a simple parameter we pass into the Bash script that tells it uh, which path to take in the script. So we know which Azure resources have to be provisioned. Okay. Um, the other thing I had mentioned is this just, uh, what you see in Azure Cloud Shell Editor is one project of the solution. Uh, behind the scenes, there's actually a web API that the script provided as well. And the web API is, is doing some of the work here as well. But we are focused on ASP.NET Core Identity and that work uh, takes place inside of the UI project, Razor now, Pages. Now, for the curious who are looking at this module and you're like, oh, I want to see the API, the API is there. Uh, because if you look down in your in your Cloud Shell uh, prompt in the lower right, it says that we're in the ContosoPest.UI project. Um, ah, okay. the, 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 there's a, uh, another project that's a peer with that one, that's ContosoPets.API, but we opened up the Cloud Editor scoped to, to UI, so that's all they would see. Should I... Change you, directories up I mean, I, You certainly could, but I mean, I don't, I don't know much, how much time we have, so maybe, maybe okay. we, we could investigate later on. Okay. So then it's just instructing you to, like, review the starter code, and is there anything specific in here that we should highlight and jump into to show our viewers? Um, you know, I, I think we will go ahead and point out the there's a couple of, of uh, things that exist in this project that, that are kind of... Uh, uh, kind of fake that we did for purposes of having showing uh, like policy based um, uh, permissions and claims. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have this mechanism where an admin self enrolls. In the real world, I don't think you want an admin to self enroll. <laughs> right, and right. and the way they do this is they get a token off of this service and this token the endpoint for the token is not secured at all so we 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 call that out pretty clearly when, when we get to that point of okay sure. don't actually do this in real life but we're, we're trying to create a scenario where you have admins enrolled right right okay uh, the other thing that we took the liberty of doing a couple of things uh one we implemented um when we get to the uh when we get to the multi-factor authentication step we mm -hmm. implemented a a a, a QR code NuGet package. Um, Ooh, cool. So the the, the ASP.NET documentation today says, okay, go get this. I forget what. It's a JavaScript based thing. It says, okay, go get this. We actually didn't like that. So we came up with, with what we, I, I think, what what we consider a, a better approach, um, mm -hmm. but we took the we took the liberty of installing that NuGet package and building a um, building a, a, a service for it to be dependency injected. We took the liberty of doing that for you. Yeah. One reason for that, I would I would say, is. 
to eliminate the context switching, uh, we assume you're a .NET developer. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't want to throw yet another language at you, which would be JavaScript in that case. We're going to handle the QR code uh, requirement using C Sharp. Uh, well, I do want to personally thank you for not throwing JavaScript at me. <laughs> on, on, on the massive stack of list of things that I'd like to do someday is go back and revisit the, um, the doc that we have out there on, on doing the QR code for the multi-factor stuff, because I, I think our mechanism that we came up with is, is arguably quite a bit better. Awesome. All right, so let's see here. So it tells me to verify the database connectivity, so I'll copy that. Shift insert, and then just run that. Mm -hmm. Now, if so, what, to explain what's going on there with that DB command, that DB command is actually an alias. So it's actually an alias for SQL command, so the command line SQL server client, with mm -hmm. the username and password and server and database name already added onto it. So the oh, that's alert, amazing. So you don't have to worry about all that stuff we set up for you. All you have to do is type DB and then the rest that's of the command. That's your database. Awesome. Cool. I love that. So that was and, pretty straightforward. So we have all the code. We pulled it down. It's running in this environment. We have a database connected. And there's some, you know, obviously as a consumer of this, you would spend a bit more time kind of investigating how the code's put together. And uh, I'm certain your, your uh, instructions and documentation here cover that. So should we continue on to the next exercise? Yep. Okay. All right. So now we are going to configure identity support. So this is this is the meat of it. This is the this is the big hard unit. This is the one that we spent the most time on uh, when we upgraded from two two to three one because this is the page mm -hmm. that had the most changes. Okay. Um. So what we we start off initially just explaining. Okay, here's the tables that underlie the identity system in ASP.NET, and and they're exposed through EF Core. And we we talk about that a little bit. Uh, I don't think we need to go into a lot of detail right now, but basically the gist of it is you have an ASP.NET users table for your users, and from there you have any number of, of foreign key relationships that that uh, you know describe other things relevant to identity, like claims, for example. Well, so this is a pretty impactful, though, because there's a lot of individuals, uh, you know, I've... Uh, prior to joining Microsoft, I was a consultant working on different enterprise, um, you know, clients, and they would try to reinvent the wheel. And, you know, they looked at security as just being like one thing where it's like it's really important to kind of dissect it into individual sections. So you have identity, you have authentication, you have authorization. And with identity, it was always one of those pain points where they're like, we're going to create our own thing and manage it. But if it's already figured out for you and the problem's already solved, why reinvent the wheel? So this is kind of nice to, you know, I guess call attention to the underlying architecture and the data structures and, and kind of visualize that. So that's awesome. Yeah, there's a reason why these frameworks exist. Security is hard. I would yep. say it's hard to get right. Unless you're David Pine, don't try it by yourself. <laughs> Use a framework. <laughs> this is why identity exists. Uh, I'm using you guys right now, so that's, that's my excuse. All right, so we're going to install the .NET code um, scaffolder. Let's copy this command. Shift insert, run that. So Scott, can you explain a little bit about what the scaffolder is? Yeah, so this uh, scaffolder, um, it's a, it's actually a NuGet package called .NET dash ASP.NET dash code generator. This is what we would call a .NET Core global tool. And what this tool is going to do is it's going to behave a bit like uh, global packages in the NPM world, where the dependency or the tool is not tied to a specific project. Um, it's called global tool for a reason. It could be executed um, anywhere on your machine uh, because an entry is added to the path environment variable. But specifically what this tool is used for in this module is scaffolding uh, components for identity. Uh, the UI components specifically. So the, the razor pages that support the various screens for authentication and authorization. You can actually use the tool for other things and we have a call out to how you would find that out in this green tip box. You could execute the .NET ASP dash, ASP.NET dash code generator uh, help command, and that would show you what else this thing is capable of, of scaffolding or generating for you in your project. Awesome. That's amazing. 
So the step that you just did, Dave, I, I saw you did the, the NuGet packages. Those NuGet packages are all the uh, prerequisites that need to be in the pack in the project before we run the scaffold and, and generate all the identity stuff. Yeah, so for those of you that were watching while uh, Scott was explaining that, I had opened up the project, the CS proj, to show what packages were already there. I ran the command, reopened it, and you can see that it added these package references. So that's, that's awesome. Let's do this now. Copy the next thing. I love that this is just so straightforward and simple. It's just literally copying commands in, um, and getting an explanation of what they're doing. So that's going to really help you know, so, people kind of learn, right? And you know, there is a reason why we have you copy and paste stuff and not just manually type everything. Uh, we, we are constrained to about an hour uh, completion time for each module that we produce. So mm -hmm. there's just not time to allow the user to do everything. Right, right. So we, we try to be hyper-focused on the important parts that we want you to take away. And like the scut work, we'll, we'll just script it and make it go away, and or you can copy and paste it, and you can you can investigate it you know, at your leisure. But the, the, right. the stuff that you came here to learn, that's the stuff that we want you to focus on. Awesome. Cool. Well, I, I ran that um, generator there, and I passed in those parameters, executed that. I refreshed now, and there's more stuff that had shown up inside the editor. So it looks as though it did its job. It scaffolded some of those pieces, and now we have more than we had before. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you're going to notice this theme throughout the module where we'll ask you to refresh file explorer in the azure cloud shell editor and the reason is when you do things like scaffold new components into the project unfortunately the editor doesn't automatically refresh when something like that happens uh, you okay. have to manually refresh to see that change sure yeah so and, and that kind of that kind of underscores the point that Scott made earlier that this, it's not Visual Studio Code. It looks like Visual Studio Code. It's not Visual Studio Code. So there's like, <laughs> there's like no IntelliSense or, or, or anything like that. Awesome. I do. So, so this first step that you're doing, you're replacing the configure um, method in the uh, identity hosting startup file that got scaffolded. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 block that you put in specifically the differences uh, between what was there and, uh, and and what what you just pasted in um, really I think it just came down to um, reading the uh, user ID and password out of the configuration out of the out of the key vault right awesome okay yeah so sure. you might have might have seen this fly by when the provisioning script was executed in the previous unit, but there is an Azure key vault that was provisioned here. Uh, we have access to that key vault. It was already wired up in the code. Uh, if you were to look at the program.cs file, David, mm -hmm. that's where you would find it. Uh, there's a configure method in there that is adding the key vault configuration provider uh, to the config API. Awesome. Okay, that makes sense. So if we scroll down, right here, there's a configure key vault method. This is what's actually doing the wiring up of key vault to this uh, project. Okay. This is one of those things where we're like, we want to do like a real world best practice thing, but we're not necessarily here to teach it to you. And that's not what you're here to learn, but we want it to be there so you can observe it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I've always been curious about Key Vault. I'm probably one of those people who's heard of it, but kind of been intimidated. And how do I get started with it? And uh, this is great. Awesome. So let's go see what we're supposed to do next. So back over in the identity startup, it looks as though I need to add a using statement for SQL. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Plop that in there. That's fine. So as he's adding this using statement, uh, the reason why this is necessary is to resolve the reference on line 19 to the SQL connection string builder object. Ah, okay. Um, this is where we debated. Um, earlier on, we were using system.data.sqlclient, and uh, turns out Microsoft.data.sqlclient is actually the better option here. It's the, uh, the newer, newer way of doing things. And one thing to call out, too, is I was curious about this, so I'll just answer my own question because I didn't get to ask the question yet. Um, I, I was curious about in here when I edit files, do I have to save it or does it save automatically? When I tried navigating away, I got prompted to save the work, but you can actually do Control-S on a Windows keyboard configuration here and it will save. I'm assuming it's the same. Or... 
There's also there's also the ellipsis button in the upper right that has a save option. Okay, awesome. So now I need to go back over to the startup. Let's go back over there. And it said this is where we're going to call that. No, nope, not that one. Not that one. Make make, oh. make make sure you look at the comment. Comment, comment. Yeah, so there's this is a common um, area of confusion here. There's actually two different startup files in this uh, project. One okay. is called Identity Hosting Startup, and the other is just called Startup. Huh. Startup is in the root of the project. Oh, no, he's, Identity, a, he, he's in the right file. Sorry, I didn't yeah. mean to cut you off, Scott. I, yeah, Identity Hosting Startup is the startup file that was added by the scaffolder when we added yeah. Identity to the project. Yeah, that's why I saved. I went back over here, so I'm in the the main startup one. Yep. Keep keep scrolling down though, Dave, on, on startup. Keep 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 going down to the configure method. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you'll see the comment. There's the comment you're looking for. Add use authentication. All right, so we're going to copy that. Do I add it before or after authorization? Uh, just replace the comment. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah, and it, it makes sense because you would have to be authenticated before you can do anything with authorization. So order does matter here, and it's, in this case, just a matter of replacing the comment with the code snippet. That would have been cool if the comment could have been the code and you just uncomment it. We had thought about that, um, and we do actually do that with some using statements in places. I can't mm -hmm. remember the reason we had that we, we landed on for not doing it that way. Do you, Scott? I don't recall. It is a good point, and we should uh, revisit that. That's it worked. We're good. So let's see here real quick. So I I did the echo, the DB connection string. Uh, so it printed there in the app settings JSON. Replace the. So I got to grab this connection string, right? Mm -hmm. And then copy, and then go over here and change this. Okay. And so what you have there right now for the con connection string value is just the default that was uh, provided by the starter project. Right, right. Okay, awesome. So I saved that. Um, let's keep going down, update the database. So we're going to do this real quick. Well, well, but, but wait, 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 wait. Before oh, we, .NET build. .NET build. Yep, we always want to check and make sure that it builds before we do this step. Got it. So... Just for clarity, the connection string that David pasted into appsettings.json allows us to connect to that Azure SQL database. And awesome. it's, it's that database that'll, uh, that's, that's where all of those tables are stored for identity, the ASP.NET users table, for example. Awesome. Now, in the, in the conceptual content that we've kind of glossed over, what we've, we've, we've told the user at this point, we're, 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 customizing identity at this point. So we have um, we have the default identity ASP.NET users table. We're going to add a couple of, uh, uh, we're going to add uh, first name and last name to it because it doesn't have first name and last name. It has username and, you know, that kind of stuff, but it doesn't have first name, last name. So that's yeah. uh, the exercise that we're undertaking at this point is we're, the very first thing we're doing is we're adding first name and last name to the identity uh, object, basically. I believe I that's actually the next unit. Um, this if I'm understanding correctly. So uh, what what we're seeing here in step two will actually uh, generate the tables in that Azure SQL database. You're right. Yeah. You're, 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 I'm, you're right. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Yeah, Sorry. what Cam was just spoiler describing alert. will, <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert, that will be done in the next <laughs> unit. But, you know, we've got these .NET EF migrations commands here. Uh, it's the Entity Framework Core migration that will... Uh, generate the DDL scripts to uh, create the tables in the Azure SQL database. And that's actually what it's doing right now is it's generating the DDL. And as we speak, yep, there, there it goes. It just went out and, and populated that initial, uh, that initial database. Awesome. And so there's the migration history. I just ran the next command that's going to query that to prove that it executed correctly. So we see that those eight rows were affected. Yep. And so out awesome. of the box... All of those tables are created in the DBO schema. Um, that's the owner here. So awesome. you, you might have noticed in that select statement, we actually filter by schema of DBO. So at this point, 
you've actually done everything to implement the identity system in its default out-of-the-box configuration except for the login link at the top of the page. And, and that's, that's that's this step right here. And the login. Copy this. So if you yep. haven't seen this syntax before, um, ASP.NET Core, I believe, version 2.1 introduced this new tag helper called the partial tag helper. Um, it's an alternative to an HTML helper for rendering a partial view. So what David pasted on line 20 there is doing exactly that. It will render the login partial uh, partial view. That's awesome. So let's just do another build here with no restore. Make sure it's good. Zero warnings, zero errors. Love that. So Another detail to point out here. So uh, we're running the .NET build command in the .NET Core CLI, passing this no restore flag. Uh, by default, .NET build will attempt to do a NuGet package restore. But uh, we can bypass the package restore at this point because no new packages have been added since the last time the project was built. Awesome. And generally speaking, it's it's going to save you you know milliseconds and not seconds. But sometimes you know depending on the project, it'll save you save you some significant time. This next command that you just fired off as web app up. It's um, from the. It's in the Azure CLI, and what it's doing is it's. It, this is the Azure CLI command for hey, the website that I'm currently working on, deploy it to mm -hmm. Azure, and okay. it's it, it's a magic command. It does a lot of stuff just automatically. Now mm -hmm. we did do some configuration for you in the script when we set up all the stuff and provisioned <laughs> all the stuff. If you hop up to the dot Azure folder in in sure. your in your file list and uh, look at the uh, config. Mm -hmm. There's there's the configuration values that it needed to know, um, and it it would have it would have prompted you for all of those and then saved that configuration file on its own if you just typed as web app up. We went ahead and configured it for you because we we you know obviously those are like randomly generated resource names. Um, so uh, awesome, that's great. I, I do have a question about it. So it mentions that it's updating the web, uh, the app service <laughs> runtime from none. The .NET Core 2.2, but we're running .NET Core 3.1. Yeah, it's that, noise. It's noise. It's okay. noise. Yeah, we we actually we noticed that yesterday when we were when we were um, when we were reworking the module uh, for 3.1. Which, by the way, 3.1 came out in November. Why are we just doing this now? It's because 3. the 3.1 SDK wasn't available in App Service broadly until okay. last week. Um, Having said, so just now is when we've discovered this, and yeah, it's giving us that noise there. We took, we actually took apart the Azure CLI source code. It, I can, it's it's just noise. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now it's done. Looks like it ran. So I can just do an echo here. Let's do that. Echo URL. So if I open this URL, what happens? You, you can click on it right there, and uh... so you might have I... noticed in the. The JSON that was spit out to the screen there, it did actually detect that we're using .NET Core 3.1. Okay. So it says the runtime version is this, but it detected 3.1, and that's just, that's fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, then, that, like I said, that, that runtime version that it's detecting, the code, if you look at the code, it's all oriented around... Uh, a .NET framework and should have no bearing on .NET Core at all. So I, I I'm not sure what the Azure CLI folks had in mind there, or if they just didn't know the didn't know the difference between Core and Framework. But it's 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 just noise, and it, you can safely okay. ignore it. So a okay. uh, question in the chat: LQ Dev One is asking, how difficult <clears throat> would it be to create that config file for existing projects? This looks incredibly simple. I'll have to try that out. Uh, I assume that's a reference to that Azure config file. Mm -hmm. uh, could you speak to that a little bit, Cam? Um, yeah, so it's it's just the old INI format. Um, that that is literally all there is to the config file. Uh, so it's pretty simple. You can create that for any existing project, and then yeah, as web app up is the only command you have to type to deploy it to app service. Um, and like I said, if you don't have that config file, the first time you run as web app up, it'll prompt you for all those values. Does it then persist them in its own config, or is this mm -hmm. something? That Oh, yep. okay. It, it persists them in, the, in in that config file right there, uh, so that so that you can uh, for for reentrant scenarios. 
Awesome. So the application is running over here. So actually, actually, I take that back. It doesn't prompt you for everything. It doesn't prompt you for like the name of the resource group. It just makes one up for you. And, sure. And I, I makes up anything that can be just made up. It makes up. So. So, like the weatherman. What? None of. What was that? Uh, oh, anything that can be made up, it just makes up. Oh, I get it. I get it. Took me a minute. Yes. It did. Uh, must have at least one non alphanumeric character. Oh, like, okay. I got you. I got you. All right. Now, bu -bu 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 -bu. register. Or press okay, button. Is that in the identity system? We didn't bother tinkering with any of those. We stuck with the default settings. Yep. Okay. So that's that's the default regex, and it can it can be tweaked. Okay, so now I have an account. Mm -hmm. I'm going to accept this. So basically I have an application that's working with identity servers. Um, I was able to register. I have authenticated now. Um, and uh, that, I mean, what, took 40 minutes? It wasn't terribly long, but it did. we've spun and up the, resources. We've done all these amazing things. Well, we, And we talked about it a lot. Um, yeah. And let's let's go back and, and just real quick, let's dig into it a little bit too. Um, mm -hmm. If you, you click the products link at the top. Mm -hmm. So... This is a pretty simple app. It's you know barely more complicated than a uh, than a to do app, but we didn't want to do the to do app because it was a bit done to death. Mm -hmm. um, so what this what this this is like your your basic uh, scaffolded razor page more or less. We did make a tweak to it. Uh, can you add a product? Yeah. <clears throat> Let's give it. Yeah, just uh, name it whatever. Some kind of dog toy or Frizz. something. Frisbee. Is that how you spell Frisbee? Yeah, it's close enough. And we're going to make that $1 million. No. That's 20 bucks. Okay. That's an expensive Frisbee. Oh, what? it doesn't want it doesn't want a, a dollar sign. Okay. All right. Now, in the default scaffolded razor page, mm -hmm. when you don't click delete yet, but when you click delete on a product in the default scaffolded razor page, what it does is it actually takes you to another screen with a, a validation that says, do you want to do this, yes or no? And then it takes you to yet another screen that actually does the delete. Um, we changed the default scaffold to do it through an Ajax post back instead. So if you click okay. delete, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you a, a confirmation prompt instead. That was much better, a much better experience. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's relevant though, because we protect that we protect that endpoint later on. All right, let's go log out, and then I'm going to close that. We're going to go back over here, and we're going to continue on to the customize. So by default, represents user identity. Blah 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 blah. Look at all these fun things. So. Contoso yeah. pets user first name. So we're adding. This is where we're going to talk about adding yeah. the first and last name. Yeah, this is the part where I got ahead of myself, um, <laughs> and that's okay. That's awesome. So, so, so yeah, we're go ahead. So yeah, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to make changes now so that we derive from uh, ASP.NET identity or what is it, ASP.NET user? Well, I forget the name of the class, but it was on the it was on the image. If you scroll up just a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, identity user. Thank you. We're going to mm -hmm. derive from identity user uh, a, 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 a derived class called Contoso Pets user. Ah, uh, okay. And it's going to add two properties. Awesome. So the very first thing that we're doing is that, that command that you just scrolled by. <laughs> <laughs> or, or did you run that already? I, I ran that, yeah. Oh, okay. So what that did was it said, okay, we're going to run that scaffolder again, but this time we need a certain list of files to be generated. Because otherwise, um, identity relies all on compiled razor modules, right? It's, is that the term, Scott? Is that what they're called? Scott yeah. dropped off, it looked like. Did we lose Scott? We lost Scott. Oh, has he, he's, has he been trying to get back in and I haven't been paying any attention? I don't know. He just dropped off just a little bit ago. Oh, I had no idea. I wondered why he was being quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. There well, he's he back. Hi, Scott. 
so Scott, what's the uh, what's the uh, we're, we're running the the user the customize the user account data step there, and we run that scaffold again, and we call out those pages that we want it the the, the files that we want it to generate. Um, that's because identity out of the box uses what are what are they called? They're called uh, Razor Razor compiled Razor pages compiled. Uh, Razor class libraries. Razor class libraries. Thank you. Anyway, uh, what we're doing is we're overwriting that and giving you the actual CSHTML that you can that you can uh, modify. Cool. Build so, the project. List files. So this is going to list all the files. It's going to that that's just going to list the files that you could generate if you wanted to. Now we we, ah, had, we had given you the okay. list in the in the command that you ran previously. We gave you the list that's relevant in this case. Got it. Got it. Okay. Awesome. So now additionally, blah, 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 blah. let's go to this. Consent of pet auth. So where is that data? Let's go to data. Where is data? Do I need to refresh? No. Um, should I have data? Too. Uh, yep, data. data is right there. Okay, it's actually under areas. So now we have that. So now, okay, so that's where you were saying that this now inherits from that and adds the additional things. So to configure this, go to the areas identity. So we go back over to this startup. And in here, we need to, instead of having that be the default, we're going to change it to this, right? So copy mm -hmm. that. Let's format that nicely. Yeah, and that's that's the biggest complaint we get on, on these modules is the mm -hmm. copying and pasting is not necessarily great in this editor. Sure. But, I mean, it is what it is. And, and, yeah, it's not, you know, it's not terrible. Our friend LQDev1 commented earlier uh, about, okay, I wonder if VS Online could replace this editor. That's the hope. You know, there's been some talk about that uh, on the Learn okay. team, Learn Engineering team, and they're definitely interested in going that route. And I'm, I'm hoping they do because it'll provide a much better experience. But this is where we are today anyway. Okay, so I added that. So I'm just following the steps here and quickly copying and pasting things into the according files. Um... So let's go back over here. So areas, identity, and then we're going to go into the pet user. And then from here, we're going to copy the user, paste them into this experience. So a little bit of clarification here. Control we Project. lost it. Can you say that one more time? Yeah, let me try again. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. sure can. Sorry, network issues over here. Uh, Contoso Pets user represents a custom implementation of identity user. The reason why we're creating this is we want to add two additional attributes to the user object, and that is the first and last name. Got it. Awesome. I think I did all that. Mm -hmm. So you you've done. By the way, you all everything that you just did there. That's pretty much like the standard. This is how we add. Um, uh, uh, properties to an entity, an entity framework, right? And then we do the, mm -hmm. the 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 loop with the up, you know, doing the EF migration and the EF database update. We cover this in our entity framework module. This really kind of builds on it. Okay, awesome. So now the things have been added. We get confirmation of that via the console spitting it out and letting me know. So let's just run this here. We're gonna verify now that we have the last name and first name and last name added so great awesome things are working working flawlessly by the way next command primary key so now what are we doing here with the primary key so we just we just threw this in there just to illustrate um it, it, you know that the um that the ASP.NET user's primary key is ID, and that's the unique identifier. That's really the only reason we had that step in there, is we want you to, to see that. Okay. Pages, account. Let's go in this one. Let me go under register. So just to, just to you know, comment, so you've created, at this point, you've made the database changes and the entity changes. So now you're going mm -hmm. and you're making the UI changes to accommodate those two new fields. Okay. So we're going to add first name and last name right here. That looks right. So we yep. have email, first name, last name. 
my copy and paste voodoo is very good today. If voodoo. Voodoo. Why am I saying voodoo? I, I don't know. Neither do I. Hoodoo? Yeah, you but, do. The babe, with the, the babe with the power? <laughs> so what are we doing here now? First and last name. So this is the input model. Ah, okay. So there's now an input model. Yeah, on, on, the, on the code behind for that registration form... Um, mm-hmm. There's a uh, there, there's a, a uh, input model embedded yep. class. So, I see that nested class. Okay. I'll put that in there, and then the formatting is entirely optional. C sharp's going to compile nonetheless. Mm-hmm. All right. So now we're going to add another thing here. So this is on the post. And this is modify the on post method, and that should be in the same file. I'm assuming on yep. post on get. Yep. So right, so what so what what we're doing at this point is we're wiring up the text boxes that you've created with the entity. Okay, is valid. That's right. Oh, so that's this here. So yeah, it's... yeah. We we expanded it to multiple lines. Nice. I like that. Okay. Save they also that. used the controversial dangling comma there. Yeah, um, co- co- yeah. <laughs> we should call that out. We call, no, call that out. No, leave leave that there. So we actually do that on purpose. Um, the I this is one of the great things that happens when when you co-author with somebody. Um, Scott taught me this, and I I'm like, okay, why why would I want to do this? But the <laughs> but the the that comma is perfectly legal. The uh, the compiler will just throw it out. But mm-hmm. the next developer that comes along who's maintaining your code and is adding stuff to that to that list, they don't it, have it, to. They don't have to. They don't have to type a comma. And likewise, it's like if you come in here and comment something out or uh huh, comment this one out, I still yeah. Or if you decided, hey, I want to order this list alphabetically by property name. Well, guess yeah. what? You don't have to add a comma. Yeah, that's a great point. I like that. I've always wondered why they did that in JavaScript. There's like certain TypeScript rules that allow you to kind of, or linting rules. So that makes a lot of sense. All right, so shared login partial, shared, shared login partial. Grab this. And this is when we're signed in. So we're going to grab this object here. I'm just going to talk to myself as I code that. Why is this not var? It's probably so you know the explicit type. I honestly don't know why we didn't make that a var. <laughs> probably so we knew the explicit type, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. All right, save that. Control S, customize the profile management form. Okay, so it's going to let us change things. So, yeah, so now you finish the registration mm-hmm. page. The problem is there's two pages where this first name and last name uh, can be edited. The first is when you register as a new user. The second is when you are editing as an existing user. So what you're doing now is you're essentially making the same changes that you made to the profile form, to mm-hmm. the registration form, you're making to the profile management form. I wonder, could that be simplified to make like a shared component or something to where you just point to that file twice if it's using the same model and the same markup? You know, that's not a bad idea. Like maybe a, like a razor partial or something. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now we're updating this model as well. And this model seems to be the exact same model that we had from before, right? That input model specific to that page. So if we mm-hmm. go to index, we've got the input model... And that's, oh, simply right here. Okay. Ta-da. <clears throat> Save that. And then go down here and grab this little bit. And that's going to be our input into the load sync. It goes here. This is, uh, this is actually why I, I, I try not to do a lot of UI. <laughs> because there's, there, there's, there's, you know, you gotta do, you know, the text box, and then you gotta do the, the, you know, whatever code behind does validation for that text box, and you have to wire it up mm-hmm. to the entity, and yeah, oh, that's all right. First name, username, last name. So that goes right here, and we have async await, which is cool. Let's save that file real quick. 
And we're building already. So, so yeah, so that ten minute exercise or five minute or whatever it was is that's everything that's required to take that out of the box identity experience and add some custom fields to it. Awesome. So that's going to build, redeploy. It's going to add all the migrations. So our database and data store has been updated. The um, CS files have been updated to represent those model changes. Our markup with the razor has been updated to represent all those changes. So now everything should be in sync and it should be working as we'd expect it to after it deploys here. All right, so I did the build. It built fine, and now I'm doing the AZ uh, web app up. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's, it's going to go. Yeah, it's going to go quicker this time too. Um. So this command will just refresh the app that already exists out on um, Azure App Service. Perfect. <clears throat> hey, I, I didn't think about it any earlier. Dave, do you happen to have Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator or something like that on your phone? Uh, I do. Okay, cool. It's going to save you a step up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bah, 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 bah. All right, what do I do now? Um, so I think what we have you do is register a new user first. Okay. To see that we have the first name, last name. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. And then I, I just, like, you would want to use another email address because your first email address is already in there once. So I, I, All right. Okay. Let's just do... Okay. Oh, come on. Needs an uppercase. So capital P at SSWZORD always works on this one. <laughs> it probably uh, shouldn't. We should probably talk to Barry about that, but... <laughs> I'm totally going to bomb this. Let me try. Oh, um... Wait for it. Oh. The best part is watching me do this, right? <laughs> they don't match. <And> <laughs> don't you love that when it happens? And now it needs an uppercase one. Oh, man. This is the, the worst part of this demonstration, right? Is coming up with a password. Come on! It looked like there was more characters in that second one than there was in the first one. I'm not counting, though. All right, that worked. That one worked. I Like, the 17th time, is the that was the ticket. The All ticket. right. Okay, so we're there. Now, so, so now you're logged in as the second user. Go, mm -hmm. ahead and, go ahead and log out at this point. And notice up in the upper right, it says, Hello, David Pine, because we made that yeah. change to, the, um, to mm -hmm. the login partial, where it would say, Hello, first name, last name, instead of okay. just Hello, username. Okay. Okay. Now, if you log out and log in as your first user again, mm -hmm. okay. Notice it doesn't say anything for him because he doesn't have a first name and last name. Now, if you click that, uh, if you, it's a, that's a link. So if you go ahead and click mm -hmm. into that link, if you click that, you can go ahead and add your first name and last name. And now, hello, hello. David Pine. Awesome. That's cool. I like that. So that is setting up and customizing identity. And um, there's a bit more here, a bit more confirmation. But yeah, I know that we're at our time box. So that was that was actually really cool. I enjoyed that. It was simple as, uh, I guess, my only feedback. I'd be really curious to, like, if anyone would be interested in actually taking, like, the logs, like, the output here, and actually going through that sequence again just to kind of mentally digest all the steps involved that actually happened. But... <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's really cool. That's that's amazing. So there's um, there's a couple of more exercises here. Now, I know I can stay beyond our time box. Um, if you guys are willing to, uh, we can do that. 
Oh, I was actually just going to say that I I have a another commitment now at noon. Oh, okay. Well, no worries. Um, you know what we'll do is we'll come into this. What I think we ought to do is some at some future point we'll come into this at this point, and then we'll mm-hmm. complete the other two steps. Awesome. This has been great, man. Scott, are you still with us, or did we did we lose you to your network again? Or we lost him to his network again. Yeah, if you could imagine a dumpster fire, that's my network right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see, I see. You had to go. Uh, if we go back to the to the to the three views to, to the three the three amigo view, there you're uh, you're a giant glowing S, Scott. Aw, you are an S a- in my S S for Scott. There you go. S for Superman. So, uh, yeah, that was that was pretty great. Thanks, Dave, for doing that. We're gonna make you be a guinea pig again. That was that awesome. Was, that was fun, and that was awesome. Thank you for letting us talk about our, our module. And uh, anybody who's watching this, um, please go check out our module. Uh, that that Aka link, uh, aka.ms slash learn dash identity. Um, or you can just go to the uh, docs.microsoft.com slash learn, and uh, you will uh, you can you can browse to it and find it pretty easily. And you can always hit us up for questions. Awesome. Thank you, friends. Yep, thank you, and see everyone next time. Bye.